Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the AFS Cinema. My name is Holly. I'm head of programs here at the Austin Film Society. And this is one of our favorite annual series, Jewels in the Wasteland, presented and programmed by our artistic director and founder, Richard Linklater. And tonight, um, we're presenting a film from Woody Allen's great period, um, ending in, well, this is 1988. And we're gonna talk about the movie after the screening. So I hope that you, this is our tradition for Jewels in the Wasteland, is watch the movie, get a great introduction by Rick, and then we'll sit up here and talk about it just after the credits roll. Um, we also have happy hour after the movie, so if you're feeling like you need a drink to, to before you discuss the Woody Allen movie, then please go get one at the bar and come back in and, and join the conversation. It's really about having a conversation with you, the audience. So we hope you'll stay. I'd like to welcome our programmer, artistic director, founder, Richard Linklater, to introduce another woman. Come on up. And I'll see you guys afterwards. All right, thanks, Holly. I wanna thank you guys for being here. I can't wait to watch this movie uh, with you here in 35 millimeter on the big screen with a bunch of people. Um, that's what we're here for. Um, you know, I think Woody Allen had the, I don't know, we can talk about this after. We can talk about a lot of things after. I want to talk about anything you want to talk about. But in this intro, I want to just throw out that the 80s was maybe the greatest decade any American filmmaker ever had. Let's go through it. <laughs> Let's start with um, Stardust Memories, Midsummer Night Sex Comedy, Zelig, uh, Broadway Danny Rose, um, Purple Rose of Cairo, Hannah, S S Hannah and her sisters, Radio Days comes, yeah, Hannah and her sisters, Radio Days, September, Another Woman, his section of New York Stories, that great 40-minute film, and then he closes out with Crimes and Misdemeanors. That's 10 features and a brilliant short. And of those 10 features, I put my personally, I don't know if I like September that much, but all the rest I just put at the top, <laughs> top shelf of, of Woody, top Woody. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we, we can talk about that after. But this film, um, I think it's a great antidote to, for those of you who were here last week, last week's toxic masculinity of uh, <laughs> colors. Uh, this is so the opposite, uh, such a female movie. This is Woody at his, you know, he really, I think he, he writes for women so well. He, he's made over and over, more than any American filmmaker, I think. He's, it's been so consistent for so long. And um, this portrayal, we're here really for Jenna Rollins, you know. And I always thought this film was lesser seen. You know, everyone's seen Hannah and Her Sisters and Crimes and Misdemeanors and Zelig, I assume. You know, all, all these films. And this one kind of snuck in. It was right in there. And I remember watching it in a theater with about three other people. And it was just, at that time, it was just, a, oh, another year, another Woody Allen movie. Not as good as uh, Manhattan. Not as good as Annie Hall. Not as good. And I was going, God, this guy's just at the top of his game, you know. One great film after another, just as an aspiring filmmaker myself. I was just going, God. And this one, I think, is the, um, you know, for an existential filmmaker like Woody Allen, I think, I would put this out there maybe as his most existential. You know, uh, Jenna Rollins, we're all used to her from, oh, you know, her husband's movies, uh, Woman Under the Influence, Opening Night, Love Stream. She's always in, like his films, kind of a lot of energy, a little amped up, a little unstable, maybe a little crazy, you know, that, that character quite often. This, she's completely opposite. She's a Woody Allen character of, German professor, I believe, a writer, um, very cerebral, controlled, lives behind a facade, very thoughtful and um, not emotional. She's writing a book, um, so she rents an apartment. Only in Woody Allen's films can you just, oh, I need some extra space, I'll just rent an apartment. You know, <laughs> very upper middle class, very uh, comfortable, let's say, even though she's just a professor and a writer. I don't know. They never seem to manage that. Yeah, I'll just rent an apartment in New York. But uh, she finds out. <laughs> she finds out that um, through a vent, she can hear 
of voices, and she realized there's a psychiatrist's office, and that she can he she can hear these sessions going on. So it's kind of like a rear window, but not visual. It's just you know it's you know, you know she can just verbal, you know, and it doesn't end in you know intrigue and murder. It ends in this woman's journey of self. Let's say it's this sends her on her own introspective period of self-analysis, self, uh, just coming to grips with herself that she's led that she's, she's not who she thinks she is, you know, and I think of this movie, and I haven't seen it in a long time, but when I think of it, I think of it as like a, almost like a dreamscape, because she's kind of, you know, synchronistically led to these <coughs> weird meetings, like it's, this is your life coming back at her, she runs into, she has these encounters with um, well, first, her first husband, um, her father is around. She runs into an old, um, Sandy Dennis plays an old girlfriend from her youth. And un unlike most encounters, they don't have any social niceties. They don't, they're, th they just tell you something about yourself, how, you know, old resentments and how you affected them negatively. And <laughs> it's, it's kind of unnerving. It's an unnerving, like, brutally honest film about, Self and I don't know if it's she, there's some dream sequences that you know in in dreams you're projecting yourself and there's one devastating one her father's played by the great John Houston in his very last film uh, I remember there's a dream sequence that I can't wait to watch again she just imagines it but he's in the psychiatrist chair recalling his whole life and his regrets so it's a devastating portrait and I think the biggest one is her her husband her second husband. Uh, Ian Holm is um, this guy. She's married, and she kind of, it was between him, and as I remember correctly, and his friend, played by G uh, Gene Hackman. And I think somewhere in there, there's regret, too. Like, the one who really loved her and understood her isn't the one she chose. She went with the philandering cad. So she, <laughs> she has to, but Gene Hackman's performance, in the, I mean, it's great performances all across the board. I mean, Ian Holm, uh, Harris Eulin, is the, you know, Betty Buckley shows up at a book signing or something it, where it's about her, her now husband, her ex-husband. She just kind of shows up and says all these inappropriate, it's just unnervingly social. But the great Betty Buckley, Texan, Texas Film Hall of Fame, um, gives this incredible one scene, pow, performance. But the movie's full of those. So... And this movie couldn't be tighter. It's only like 81 minutes, and it's just clips along. It was just such a beautiful, contained movie, as I remember. So, um, and, and Gene Hackman, very sweet, as I remember. He's got a smile. He's charming. He was the, the one who got away. But he's around. You know, he's a writer or something. So you don't see, he's usually the tough guy, right? Here he's kind of a romantic guy. So I always remembered that, you know. Um, so... Like I said, we will talk about anything and everything after this. And uh, thank you so much for being here. And let's enjoy the movie. All right. Ah, oh, that was beautiful. All right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was great. All right. How many are Team Larry Lewis? Team Ken? <laughs> <laughs> any any Team Ken people? <laughs> Uh, you gotta love that Sven Nyqvist, or yeah. you can say Nyqvist, um, cinematography. This is, I yeah, think, yeah, they did a number of films together. Yeah, this, this was is the first. first. I think yeah. this was the first collaboration, and of course, Woody Allen is a huge, huge Bergman fan. Right, and I think that kind of hurt him. You know, I sit here remembering those reviews and the vibe of the time when this came out. It's like, oh, you know, would be Bergman, and every time Woody did anything that wasn't a comedy. He just got just killed t to do something thoughtful like this or, you know. And uh, they just always kind of just discounted him completely. I think time maybe is changing that. But, yeah, he did a number of films with Sven Nyquist. And then uh, Sven worked with, a, you know, he had an American career. He shot a film here in town in the 90s. And uh, I think he did, was it What's Eating Gilbert Grape, I think? Yeah, yeah, he was in town. We did a little... Um, Spin fest while he was here, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the great, s you know, Swedish photo uh, cinematographer who had uh, 
uh, you know, Bergman wasn't making so many movies by, you know, after Fanny and Alexander, so he just moved here and had a good, you know, last chunk of his career. But, you know, it still feels like every other Woody Allen movie. It's just a little prettier, I guess. But, you know, he's always worked with, he's had a good run with a lot of people, but the movies are still shot the same. You know, I'm always just amazed how he will hold the camera and just play out a long scene and, you know, profile. You know, people kind of quit shooting movies like that, like in the, I don't know, a long time ago, <laughs> you know, if you think of the 80s, Woody's always been completely out of place and time, you know. Um, yeah, even one time he, he actually came to Austin once. How, was anybody here went there? He, he showed up. We thought this was a joke, you know, like um, he had had this great run at Orion, but they had gone out of business. You know, they just made every film he wanted to make for this era. But some point in the, uh, I guess it was somewhere in the late 90s, um, he had had a new distributor, and they di they made him do a little press, which he never did. He had to go to like four cities, and he said he'd never been in Texas, so he'd come to Austin. And it was Thomas Schatz, you know, Tom Schatz at the UT, and it was just a rumor. We had like, okay, there's a special screening of Hollywood ending, and Woody Allen's gonna be there, <laughs> and like the whole Austin film scene that got word of it. We all showed up. I remember running into Lewis Black before, it, like, this is a joke, right? They're gonna like show us some preview to some other movie or something's up. But sure enough, Woody Allen walked right out and they did a little Q and A after that movie and uh it, it was it was kind of funny i mean cuz they asked him like who are your favorite you know tommy who are your favorite filmmakers and it was like the year was 1966 it was like well fellini and antonioni and bergman and i was like wow you know how his music's always like nothing after what 1940 <laughs> whatever it was kind of like his film <laughs> and stuff like i don't think he had any contemporary examples of anything that had been inspiring to him i mean he does kind of live in his own but you know it's a that's its own little cinematic universe but uh that was that was kind of cool woody and austin yeah i mean i guess now he has probably his own screening room where he can watch whatever he wants in new york yeah. but i know a friend of mine was his projectionist for a while but i mean in, when he was young it was apparently he was like not an outdoorsy child <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and so he just went to movies all the time and and, and stayed in that era or stayed yeah. in in his movies sort of era of discovery and you know comedy you know he was a professional comedy writer as a teenager famously on show of shows there's a really a uh, great chapter of his life from the 50s into the 60s till he starts doing his own stand-up as a writer you know working with all those great writers and yeah there's there's a couple lifetimes in there i don't know if you saw there was an excellent documentary made a few years ago you can get it on is it hbo netflix whatever um that really shows that he's very open you know you're in his room with his typewriter and you see how he kind of works it's pretty intriguing you know there's there's no one else remotely like him you know and I don't know if those 10 years you know I threw that out there the best you know I don't you know I, I would say the combination of quantity and quality you know it's hard to say you know Coppola in the 70s you know those Scorsese in the seven, you know but uh I just think the consistency of the work and I think in the 90s it started to change but I still I still think he goes like two for three you know <laughs> I've always had you know even on his worst day even when he's making a comedy it's better than you know, so many people's efforts, you know, so I always give them a Well, there's like, a, there's a, a level shot. of ambition in every project yeah. that's trying for something new or trying for something yeah. different, and you rarely don't see that in his films. Where I know, he's even he doesn't get much credit, like, cinema language-wise, but I really do think he's quite inventive, you know. Um, people think primarily he's a, he's a writer who, I think because he had that background in comedy, they don't take him that seriously as a filmmaker, but he really cinematically i think he's he's very um you know innovative I, I just so funny having not seen this in a long time and what you remember what you don't remember i kind of forgot the the beauty of those dream sequences where she you know she jumps back temporary you know she's her current self and then she walks out of the frame and she's her young self and the way the camera moves and all that even looking at those pictures and then jumping to you know, the flashbacks and the images. I don't know. I just find that very beautiful and very much the story. You know, he's not just showing off. He's really telling this story in a very uh, cinematic way. The device of even having the the voice coming through the wall yeah. and this idea of that, that voice changing her, that's just an such a cinematic device. And I think, yeah. you know. Cinema does voyeurism so well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it just does. 
But it's also very, um, the, the little sequences are, uh, the little um, like flashbacks are very wild strawberries also, which yes. is, uh, you know, I, there's a lot in this that seems like, oh, he's pulling out the, the Bergman references. And even, and I think this is just maybe the Nyquist cinematography, but there's like this almost leave Allman persona to mm -hmm. to um sorry not terrible descriptor but um to general Rollins and this the way she looks the way she's lit and it's especially in those in those daylight scenes it just yeah. she has this she evokes it this it helps to get presence that like general Rollins face as Liv almonds you know it's just that stunning those angles that beauty you know she's so this is such a great performance of hers but um yeah i think a lot of what you know a few years ago blue jasmine people said oh that's kind of like his streetcar, you know, updating. I don't even know if he's conscious of this. You know, he's probably taken in everything and it comes out. I doubt he sat down and said, I'm going to do my wi wild right. strawberries, but it's like. So when you saw this, you would have just seen, you know, all the, you, you would have known Jenna Rowland's career up yeah. to now. And this must have been a surprising performance yeah. to see Seems so in the late 80s. Yeah, compared to what we'd seen her in. Um, but it just goes to show, you know, like if you had any doubt, what a great actor. You know, that I think she can do anything. She's, you know, just amazing. So, Did you remember her performance when deciding to f pick this film? Yeah, yeah, I remember being so moved by her performance. And such a portrait of, you know, that kind of that middle age and that, uh, that, that emotion kind of behind it. And I'd kind of forgotten the hopefulness at the end. <laughs> I don't know what that says. But, um, I had yeah, the way she... <laughs> That you know, that was such a possibility of change, you know, that middle age and God. And when I saw this first, th they were all so old. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that that still there's still this possibility of change. She's gone through this, and you know, there's kind of hope for her. You know, that some of these negative, like maybe she can recover that with her brother. Maybe she will retain that. Maybe, maybe her and Larry might hook up. Who knows? I hope so. He does seem in love with her. I think it's amazing to see her in this too. To I mean, we've we're expecting her to give us these big, loud performances, and we're expecting I her know. to like leave it all on the table. And here we're you waiting get a for couple it almost. Little, only yeah, when she has that fight about you know her abortion, and you know, there's only a few little moments where she kind of cuts loose. So, I th but that's why she's so brilliantly cast because you know. Kind of like he describes that kiss, he could feel the passion, and then the wall came up. So this whole performance is that wall, but you can feel, we can feel what's just underneath, you know. So that's exciting, you know. I think the camera and all of us really pick up on that. So I, you, can't, you can't imagine anyone else playing this. And you know, I gotta say those scenes with her and Mia Farrow, those are so powerful too, because those are two two of the greats, you know, in the same frame. It's it's yeah. it's really it's powerful. It's so great once they're finally together, yeah. and you—it's sort of like it's, it's fulfilling this, some wish it's been of the this film. Dance mm -hmm. Up to that point, but to see them, you know, together—that's really. Does anybody have any so, yeah, thoughts they wanted to share about the film? Anything you guys wanted to talk about? So we can keep it going. Yes, down here. Uh, Right, so yeah, so we have cameras, so that you know, talking a little bit about face to face, but also the ending when we almost are expecting to get ten minutes more of this film, and you were saying in the beginning how great it is that this movie. I think it's what is it, eighty one or eighty five? Yeah, he made several minutes. like 80, <laughs> 80 minute movies in this era. You know, Zelig is short. A lot of these aren't long. They're like perfectly crafted, you know, stories, short stories. Why be any longer? You know, there was a, an inflation obviously happening through this era in Hollywood that hasn't ended. I think the negotiation was you had to have three or four endings by now. Now it, we're up to ten. But uh, 
you know, he just had the courage to kind of end his movie where it, he felt it needed to end. You know, it's it's kind of great. You know, he but again, he's not really up on the trends you know <laughs> of how to <laughs> you know what the audience expects nowadays you know that's what i always admired he just kind of kept making his movies and you know didn't really care what what people were saying you know bergman be damned you know or any he was never trying to prove something i think it didn't feel like it you know yeah right here Yeah, I think sure. just because they have similar interests doesn't mean he's, you know, he's an American. I, I, he's so clearly himself. It's just people draw the connective tissue. But you're right, yeah, Bergman set such a tone. He looms so large over world cinema from the late 50s on, I guess. And, you know, still does probably. But that doesn't mean no one else can explore some of the th things he was exploring. You know, it's different cultures, different people, different times. Certainly makes films more interesting when the characters have an interior life, and that's what we see a lot in Woody Allen. Yeah, yeah. he goes there. Um, yes, back here. Yeah, I, I think so. I, th I believe that's Ronan Farrow in there. If you <laughs> <laughs> might have heard of him lately, he wrote that piece in the. <laughs> I believe that's Ronan in the. But the very small part of the movie, but he's there. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's prominent actually. Um, I don't know. I wonder what he thinks about that these days. Ah, <laughs> I did love his New Yorker article though. Brave and very important. Brilliant guy. Yes. Well, I think with Woody Allen, I mean, his films are just so beautifully cast. I mean, yeah. Oh, isn't he Sandy Dennis is so and again that was a it s uh, sadly turns out to be a later Sandy Dennis performance because she died young you know she had ovarian cancer or something in the or she died by the early nineties so this is a later sadly because she's wonderful wow boy the camera yeah they're all good they're all good and if you hear w like I know actors who've gone up to Woody Allen <laughs> movies you know you go in and. I guess he's so painfully shy. He doesn't, it's awkward for him to meet actors. So it, the same story from every actor I've ever known. And they always get cast, but they go in and it's like, oh, come meet here. And he, he just goes, oh, hi, how you doing? And then, and then you leave. He spends about seven seconds with you. And it's like, oh God, that went terrible. And then you get a note like, okay, yeah, you start in a few <laughs> weeks and here's your pages. You don't really get the whole script. Someone comes by. and waits while you read the script and then takes the script back and you know it's this world and uh, you know but those instincts you know are like okay that's the right person for that's who I'm thinking and when he when he gets it right which is 90 percent of the time it's great but you know to be honest there are some roles that I think oh Slight miscasting, and he's he's been the one. I w was it September, my lesser favorite film. <laughs> I think that's the one he re reshot the whole movie. Like he ended up not like you know when you kind of direct like he does. Kubrick's a lot like this too. I think it's so much cast dependent, and then they don't spend a lot of time molding that person. And you either have to be perfectly cast or not, and they don't really want to spend a lot of time getting you to where you're not. So. You just get a movie, and I can think of a few Woody Allen movies, especially in the, in the last 10 or 15 years where I go, I like the script, I like everything, I just don't know if I believe that, that I think they're miscast, you know? So it, it happens every now and then, and you just feel like 
I don't know. If, yeah, just just here and there. Dawn. I always just almost wondered what took him and Jenna Rowland so long to work together. <laughs> I know, and then that that becomes, and if I'm correct, that's the only time, right? Yeah. It's just a one off, yeah. which is, I mean, it's it's amazing. But you know, he catches waves with people. Right. My old friend Parker Posey was in like three or four witties in a row, and she's like, "Yeah, like I hope you can be her this new Judy Davis or something." You know, you just whatever the parts mm -hmm. are, and what you know, and but it's kind of mysterious from an actor's point of view. You're in, and then there's not a part for you, and then. You know, so well, apparently, I think hadn't she turned him down for a role at some point, and then I think Maybe. I remember reading that, and then yeah. th this ended up working or out. She wasn't available, or you right. know, the usual things. And right. You know, to his credit, I think that's why he was able to be prolific so much through the, a lot of movies. They're so cast contingent. You know, you have one person, and then they're not available for nine months. That's when the filmmaker sits on their ass for nine months waiting for a cast member, which is really hell sometimes. So he never does that. If you're not available, he just goes to the next person. So, and I think because the scripts are so well written, usually that they kind of get can carry you over over that so well. Mm -hmm. so. so we went through a whole list of the great Woody Allen movies that we could have shown in this series. <laughs> so if yeah, we hadn't shown <laughs> this one, what? What would oh. we have shown? Again, I'm trying to show things that we haven't, People haven't seen, seen that but much. In terms of your Just 80s. Just pure cinematic yeah. enjoyment. If I could watch one more Woody Allen, like right now, only because I haven't seen it in a while, I love it so much, is probably Zelig. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that lately. And I just I just thought it was so kind of brilliant, you know. But God, it, you know, that's a, it was a good decade. It was a lot of those. Uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors, I could watch any, any time. It's funny, his own lack of presence. You know, there's only a handful of films, particularly more and more as we go along. But in this era, it was really rare for Woody not to be in his own film. You know, it, was, it had only happened a couple times, I think. And, uh, yeah, you sort of feel that, but it, it, it changes the tone of the movie. And some people criticize that. They say they needed his comedic relief in Hannah and Her Sisters to get over, you know, it... it it's so important to the balance and even crimes and misdemeanors. He's kind of the comedic sidebar to this horrific kind of narrative that's going on. A guy is moves slowly to murder, you know, so, it, but he's the, he and Alan Alder, this kind of comedic relief. So this movie doesn't have it. I guess it doesn't need it. It would be awkward, but <laughs> I don't know where it would go, but he seems to, get it in a lot of other movies that, you know, pretty, you know, what's so fascinating to me about Woody Allen is just his narratives, the way he can kind of create situations and narratives, entire movies, just to hang a bunch of ideas on, you know, he, he's really brilliant at it. Um, what's the, uh, is it Deconstructing Harry is a brilliant one from the 90s where it's really just a series of, uh, God, I skit would be too demeaning but it's just these little vignettes and they're all really funny and brilliant but the story the way it he's in this guy's mind is just hilarious and, and a lot it's of great stuff. It's one of the stuff. funniest I think. Yeah but that's such a weird yeah. narrative and what's the story to Deconstructing Harry? It's one guy's little Yeah an obsession with playing with ideas and yeah, psychoanalysis yeah. and then you know. I he gives himself permission to, right. to kind of throw in all these kind of kitchen sink ideas maybe the out of Focus actor, <laughs> remember Robin Williams? Do you remember that? It's just brilliant, you know. Anyway, but I think that's his process. I think to some degree. I think as a comedy writer, he can't ever completely get away from that. He mm -hmm. has a funny idea, and he will build what's kind of a, a short story or even a a punchline to one idea, and he will find a place for that idea. I think it's a bunch of scraps of ideas that he will you know, weave into his narrative. And a lot of it, especially once he's in, they are kind of punchline-y, you know. The comedian is very, uh, the stand-up comic is there, you know, with the, with the punchlines. And that's just, you know, kind of unique to him, I would say, to s in, so many, in so many ways. He can get away with it, you know, it works perfectly. And the thing that he probably trusted the most when he st first started filmmaking was was the comedy, you know, to yeah. to know that he could do that even before he could well direct. That's, that's all he did, you mm -hmm. know, those first films. That was his only thing. I mean, when he finally stepped out and 
started getting a little more serious, you know. He, there were more and more literary references. and I mean, they, th those were in the early comedies. But he, I think he had a bit of a, you know, if you watch Stardust Memories again, you can see him actually having almost an early mid-career crisis over thinking the world wanted him to make comedies and he was moving in this other direction. I think he was a little, he couldn't not have been aware of that how much people resented like interiors to do that after Annie Hall mm -hmm. or you know when he w would do that I think he um, was was well aware of that and then I think after his you know and, and I think it's actually a weakness of his that he's content he goes back to now like oh I'm not in a good way I made some bombs you know I'm gonna just deliver a good old yeah. comedy and it's like well I don't know if he can do the good old comedies in that way, you know, Curse of the Jade Scorpion is right. his idea of an old comedy. It's like, eh, I don't know, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't, don't, you don't have to do that for us, you know, just do, you know, I don't know. It's funny. Do you <laughs> think that's what's happening? I, I, I can't tell, but I, that's an interesting theory. No, yeah. no, I think he just kind of comes back to it, but I yeah. think it's a loop in his head that right. that's what the people want. Right. But the dude's like 81 now. <laughs> I just don't, <laughs> you know, he's still very funny, but I, I don't. I just want him to do whatever he wants. Okay, we got uh, some hands up, so we'll we'll go here. Uh, how do you think the wizard holds up against his other three movies? Like personally, I see Match Point is his, if not favorite of his. But <coughs> how does how do you compare the other three different movies? Like, does it this one? I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I think from this period, this is. I don't know. I I take it more serious. To me, it's more interesting. I like Match Point quite a bit, but. Match point is has that it's almost like plotty. It almost revisits crimes and misdemeanors to the mm -hmm. central point to such a degree, different place. But um, I don't know. I kind of prefer the existential crisis one to the. Uh, I don't know what uh, what genre is match point. <laughs> what do you call it? In Woody's subgenre, name it. What is that? Ooh. <laughs> the uh, dark, <laughs> dark territory there but um match point has like an accidental comedy sometimes but like i don't yeah. i mean not to judge it but like there is so much about it that you're like i think at, at some point like i think maybe he finds this funny <laughs> there's like yeah. moments of that film that that are played for drama that are somehow oddly i don't know yeah. i i haven't watched that movie in a while it's just my m memory yeah. of it yeah yeah i like it Well, and this is a professor too. It's female, but yeah, I think he's that's a default uh, position he goes to a lot. Um, I don't know. Are they always on the brink of? I guess yeah. yeah. Like quite crimes and misdemeanors were like the subject of the documentary you just mentioned. Is that the same with this? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But there it is in um, Annie Hall himself, Alvy Singer, who's a comedian. He's, you know, the, the he's trying to drag her to sorrow and to pity. The the book he's reading is the death. Well, what's the death of a? No, it's a philosophical book. Uh, We've all read death it. And death and dying. Death. Death. Oh. But it features prominently in, in Annie Hall. There's one book. He's, it's a famous book. Ooh, I know this. I've read it, but I can't remember the name of it. Damn. Um. I don't know. I th I think it's kind of um, it's just kind of interesting how all these people are so passionate about what they're doing, and yet they're like they feel so removed from the world. And yeah, there's always that. Which is kind of funny, back. right? Because yeah. you're like they're doing it because they're so passionate about it, like. In you know, General Rollins in this film is, you know, sh you she's in love. She's reading Rilke at night. You know, it's like she's she's loving what she's doing, and yet this is the thing that's that's keeping her away from the world. Well, as as 
Larry says. It's all up here. I was just going to try to represent him in a way, get along with Oh, certainly. Yeah. I, I think so, too. Yeah, clearly. I think he's very personal. He'll never admit it. You know, he never admits to autobiography, you know, in his films. But, you know, I think it's kind of obvious. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would think. I don't, you know, know all the details. But he seems to. Um, Juliet Taylor, I think, is she still? I think they've had a quite a long run. Yeah, okay. On the new film. Yeah, that's an amazing. I think she knows what he's looking for, and she's always good at getting, because I think he's out of it to whatever degree. You see him kind of shoehorning in the latest stars who are going to look good. You know, there's, you know, in Celebrity, there's Leonardo DiCaprio post-Titanic. There's, you know, Josh... Roland's the new star. Oh, there he is. You know, I think she's good at, you know, kind of putting people in front of him who will, A, help the film in whatever commercial reality, you know, the realities of that with who he, she thinks he might. You know, he's got that thing for faces, too, you know, of that. And those are some of the smaller parts often. But I don't know. And, you know, he's blessed that most people, most actors do want to work with him, you know, so... They get those screw, you know. He writes a letter like, "Will you consider playing this part?" And they're all just like, "Yeah, you know, Woody Allen movie." <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of actor friends that are like, "I never got that letter. Where's my Woody Allen? I want to, <laughs> you know, I'm just waiting for that that sequence where they've all heard about." But he he get a little handwritten note asking, you know, you know maybe consider the part of you know so and so. All right, maybe we have time for a couple yeah. more. Um, He's so out of it, yeah. The best is the parking I mean there's, there's in Greenwich Village, which he just parks in Greenwich Village, and you're like, uh oh, a block away from the destination. It's like, it's so beautifully imagined, you know. 80s was a shithole. <laughs> Even in Central Park, I lived there the summer of 88, like, I was there like a long summer. It was like crackheads, and it was crazy. But it's just, you know, you control that set. Like, let's just have, yeah. No, it's very romantic in that way, you know, that's your prerogative, <laughs> you know, but, uh, <laughs> and it's been interesting to see him once he got and got kicked out, or, you know, I guess the financing of films changed a lot, but you got to say, you know, he's over in Spain doing Vicky Cristina Barcelona's in London, you know, he's now a world filmmaker, and he goes into these communities, and, you know, I think he's doing a similar version of that wherever he is, but he can't help it, you know, and I don't know if he's ever if people who live in those cities go, oh, he's capturing this city, there's like, he's capturing like a, the, the, that part of it. That's know, the movies. Th that we all, yeah. <laughs> Again, he's a 40s romantic, you know, he's, that's th his old Hollywood view, you know, of the world. It's amazing he's been able to keep as contemporary as he has, you know, for someone who doesn't, you know, I, I had a friend who asked him once, like, there was some, you know, young club scenes, and you know, he's like, "How the hell do you, how do you do that? How do you know?" He says, "Oh, that never changes. That world's, it's the same." And he's like, you know, "I okay. do love parties in Woody Allen movies. It's oh just yeah. like that's, <sighs> they're just so great, and there's something that yeah. you just, or what you feel like you've walked right in, and the, and and energy, the people, and the costumes of this era are just <laughs> so great. You're like, yeah. everyone's wearing tweed." I know. Everyone. You know, same casting director, same Jeffrey Curling. You can just, Santo Loquasto, the same name, Susan Morris, the editor. He just had this kind of great team going from one film to the next. The DP's changed a little bit, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty remarkable run. And, I'm, and just when they like to put filmmakers out to pasture, he really w was just adaptable enough to keep going. Like I said, going to other cities, and he just – took his New York films and set them somewhere else, I guess. But, you know, he keeps going. So. All right, let's do, do one more, and then let's talk about next week. Yeah.
Well, well, it's also it's a guy who's been in the, that chair for fifty years or whatever, you know. So I th he probably has a lot of ideas that come out of that. Apparently, you know, he says he's been in psychoanalysis. I don't know if he still is. Uh, who knows? But uh, that was always a big part of his life, you know. So uh, it is a good, you know. I guess it's in like an epistolary way to say a lot. But I. You know, I forgot how the John Houseman scene worked. I thought it was just a dream. I forgot she was in the, of course, you know, she had to be there to witness it. But I have another patient, and he walks right by her. And that scene is so, John Houseman's like 88 or something. It's, it's, he was, he had died before the movie even came out. So, and that's one take, man. He just, you can see him kind of struggling. But that's like, ooh, you know, Houseman, what a, what a career, you know. He produced Citizen Kane, for fuck's sake, you know. I mean, he's like. Yeah, but I really do think this is kind of a dream film, so much of it. I mean, that's an obvious dream, but to me, the other parts seem kind of dreamy. Did anybody else kind of feel that way? That's just kind of how you're like, Yeah, I, I mean, because the narration is so, you know, you don't quite believe her, and then what you're hearing through the vent, I believe. You're like, is it in yeah. here or out there? Yeah, so, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So next week, we're showing They Live. They Live, the John Carpenter that's a whole. And I hope you that's got your a, tickets. That's a change of gear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what. Um, it is. I think the Wednesday is sold out or close to it. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, but we are sh film. showing. We're doing other screenings. We added screenings of the film, and we do record these conversations. So if you didn't get your ticket, you can oh. still get one for one of the subsequent screenings and watch the conversation wi on online yeah. after. But I hope you're coming oh. on Wednesday. But tell us about the movie. For they live. Yeah. You know I. I don't even know what I'm going to say about it. I remember thinking it was just really a subversive, crazy film at the time. I thought it was a real, um, just a good little F you to the 80s yuppie Reagan era <laughs> culture. You know, I just, uh, consumerism, all that. You know, Carpenter's, he's pretty uh, funny, you know, I think. So he's got a great bite. So you'll definitely be revisiting it next week. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to see, it, see how it holds up. It's different than so many other titles in here, but I thought it represented a kind of movie, you know, the uh, kind of a really a great effort along, you know, in a genre way to kind of, you know, what exploitation films have always, you know, the best version of that. You can actually use that to say what you what's really on your mind politically. So you make it kind of this horror crime. I don't even I don't even remember the story really. Is it a you know, but uh, I just <laughs> you rem it's so funny what you remember. It's just kind of the oomph behind it was was a good one, you know. So I'll have to think about it. So, but uh, yeah, it should be should be fun, you know. Great. I don't know if that's much of a sales pitch. <laughs> <but> <laughs> Let's Apparently discover it doesn't together. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's maybe that one doesn't show much. That's why people want to come. So anyway, well, come check it out if you can. Come to all the all the rest. Yeah, we've got some great ones coming up. We've got high hopes after that. Yeah, and Mike Lee's first breakthrough film in the U.S. He had made films before, but high hopes. So that was the first one we all saw. And yeah, and we just have our and we have our November December calendars, which have the rest of the series out in the lobby. And so you know pick Woody one. Woody has a new one. film coming out too. Wonder yep. Wonder Wheel. I've heard it's great. But uh, we have the same distributor, and they said, uh, it's dead. No Because he said that thing the other day about whatever. <laughs> he just <laughs> they said, no one's going to go see that movie now. It's like, uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, well, thanks for being here. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> have a great night. And join us for happy hour if you would like to. We have great tickets.